Say it out loud. Thank you. Lord, I want to thank you that you brought me through cancer. And I'm here today, Lord, by your, your healing and your strength.
times we struggle, um, we face good times. You've always been there, and you will always help us. And we give you the praise and honor in Christ's name. Amen. You know what we did in effect as we just celebrated Thanksgiving? A few days early, because we thought we genuinely thank the Lord, didn't we? And so we celebrated. I got a, somebody wrote this, I think it's a prayer request, I'm not sure. Did somebody write this, some kid? Or somebody who writes like me? Everybody know? I can't read it. It says, I on something or other. Can you read it? I'm glad, glad to pray about it if I knew what it said. trust them when we need each other, but God has, in fact, created those 
who are unmarried and like it that way. Um, and there are those, and this is what I really want to get into, but let's look at this text in 1 Corinthians first. 1 Corinthians 7, and this is Paul talking. You know, there is no real hard evidence that Paul was married, although he was, if he was in the Sanhedrin, that was one of the qualifications. Now, what might have happened is he was married and his wife died. We don't know that, or maybe he was not a customer. A regular part of the same It may have been possible that the Apostle Paul was never married. At least at this point in his life, he is in fact unmarried. 1 Corinthians 7, 7 through 9 says, uh, For I wish that all men were even as I am myself, for each one has his own gift from God. A gift from God. One of this manner and another of that. But I, what, did I, what verses did I say? Seven through nine? But I, um, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain at even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to be married than to burn with passion. And then you have down verses 32 through 35. It says this, um, but I want you, want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please him. But he who is married cares about the things of the world and how to please his wife. Now he's saying this by permission, and let me understand that. This is not a, thus saith the Lord. There is a difference between the wife and the virgin. An unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, and she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she can please her husband. And, and you could include children. And this I say for your own profit. Not that I put forth, put a leash on you, but for what is proper and that where you may serve the Lord without distraction. Verse 39 and 40. <laughs> a wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes. Only in the Lord. But she is, and he says, but she is happier if she remains as she is according to my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. This is Paul talking about a situation that he's in. in. He is unmarried. And he loves to serve the Lord. He's got a lot of time to serve the Lord. And he says, uh, there are those who are married because of your obligations to your, your husband or to your children or to your wife. It detracts from the fact that you can serve the Lord full time. Uh, I know that is true in many cases. And, I, and you can serve the Lord while well, married. That's not what Paul is saying. You know, um, I, the first church I pastored, there was a gal there, she loved the Lord. Um, she spent a lot of time in prayer. I can't remember her name. Right no. Anyway, this gal, um, she just enjoyed her time with the Lord. Then she got married. And then she, it was like, what has happened to my spiritual life? I've gotten married here. I've got to look after my husband. We're going to have children. And there was a change in her spiritually. And I always looked at it, well, good gosh, it's a blessing to be married. You know, I never, I never fully understand that. But what Paul is saying here is you do have kind of an exclusive if you're not married. But I'm going to tell you something here. And this is something we've never really dealt with. We have widows here. We have single women here. We have single men here. How many of you want to be married again? Then you come up here. How many want to get married again? If you're here today, well, you are getting married. We're praying for you. You don't need to get this one married. 
fun up there. Anyone else? Seriously, you know, as a pastor, you know, we've never prayed about it. There's maybe gals who are widowed or um, would like, or single gals or single guys who would like to get married. We are going to pray for you. If you want to come up here, we're going to pray for you. We'll slow up the Lord and see what he's going to do. There's only one. Come on, Christina. <laughs> If you're a single person and you want to get married, come on up here. We're not just going to pray for you. You're not desperate. We're just going to see you. We're ready to have the right date. It's not that time. Come on now. And if there are those who are widowed, come on, elders, come on up and help. If there are those who are widowed, because I know some of you are, are lonely, and you'd like to be married again, we are going to pray for you and pray with you. This is something we've never done. We've seen it happen in our church where a gal or a guy will lose their mate and they're lonely and they're not sure if they want to get married again. If you're content with where you are, that's okay, isn't it? There's nothing wrong with you. If you say, oh, I don't want to get married again. I'll never find a guy like the one I had or I'll never find a gal like the head. And anyone else, you know, we want to encourage you. We don't know what God wants to do for you. Pray with us. <laughs> Not right now. Right. Yours is coming in February. Yeah, Dan being very serious. Um, if you didn't feel free to come up here today, maybe you're a you're, you're weirdo, but in your heart you have to be married again. And you want to see if anyone private here, if you have a friend, talk to them and say, you know, that's my heart's desire. I'd like to be married again. Uh, that's where it starts. Pray about it. We, don't, we can't. We're not a dating service here. And we're not a big enough church where we've got a, a lot of possibilities. Yes, I was thinking of you. Go yeah, ahead.
It may happen that your loved one dies or something happens. But remember, God hasn't gone anywhere. Who is our husband? Jesus. He's always with us. He said he'd never leave us nor forsake us. He is our, even for us guys, you know, he's the one. Because we're the bride of Christ. Okay, now let's go on here. This is an unusual one. Turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's, it's something that's said in passing, so I, I really don't know, but it's something certainly we can deal with or look at. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Um, let's see if I can find the actual verse. It says this, it says, uh, starts in verse 1, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass and or plain symbol. Symbol, excuse me. And though I have the gift of prophecy, you know, he's talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could move mountains, if I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, we're talking about the gift of giving, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. In there, there's an illusion to martyrdom. Now, martyrdom is an interesting word. Um, it doesn't just mean dying for one's faith. It means suffering for one's faith. You know, in the world today, we have many Christians who are suffering for their faith. Now, we know that the Muslims have it all wrong. They, they say, well, if I am martyred, if I die with blowing something up, I get these how many virgins I, virgins I forgot. But it's a, they think it's an honor to be martyred. You know, and they're wrong. But it isn't, you know, I mean, as far as for what they're doing. But scripture is very clear. There are those who will be martyred. There are those who have been martyrs. Fox's Book of Martyrs tells of these people who have given up their lives for the sake of the gospel. We could talk about John, um, who was beheaded by King Herod, but let's look at Acts 7, 54 through 60. Acts 7, 54 through 60. Now, I'm only giving you what I, I believe Scripture teaches here. Um, if, in fact, you die, it's a gift you only give once. And yet I know that if we were ever faced with that kind of situation, God would give us the grace, the anointing, and the power to go through it. Just like he has done everyone else, as we see in the life of Stephen, it says in 54, and when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth, but he being full of the Holy Spirit, look where he's at, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he said, look, I see heaven open, and the Son of Man standing there at the right hand of God, why was Jesus standing? He was standing to receive Stephen. And they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran on him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city, and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man called Saul, or Paul. And as they stoned Stephen, and as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, Receive my spirit, and he knelt down and cried out with a loud, loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That's martyr. That's martyr. And if you were to look in the book of Revelation, you see it happening. When you were studying the book of Revelation, there are going to be Christians martyred for the sake of the gospel. 
Revelation chapter 14. Revelation, you know, we're studying the book of Revelation on Sunday nights. It's been a little scary at times. But we just have to accept it at face value. Revelation 14, verses 12 and 13. Um, it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, for they may rest from their labors and the works that may follow them. These are those who are, are blessed because of martyrdom. And uh, when it's talking about this, it's just saying that if it happens to us, we can't go out in a blaze of glory. We can't go get an M16 or get some kind of weapon and try to battle the things that are going to happen at the end of time because God is going to allow the Antichrist, as it were, to attack Christians and behead many Christians. I didn't say that. The Bible says that. The Word of God says that, that there are going to be those who suffer martyrdom at the end of time. Um, <laughs> and it's a gift we can only give once. I have to go more into that, but let's look at John 12, 23 through 26. John 12, 23 through 26. You know, I don't think any of us would want to have that happen to us. And uh, fortunately, we live in a country where that hasn't happened. Now, but there are places in this world where, in fact, it is happening. You know, just uh, kind of a sobering thought. But see something wondrous about this thing called martyrdom. John 12. 23 through 26 says this, and this is Jesus talking. He says, But Jesus answered, saying, The hour has come that the Son should be glorified, that Jesus is going to be crucified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and it dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it in eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And, and where I am, that they may be my servant, be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. Jesus says, and it's very clear, when we plant a field, the seed dies. What happens? We get a harvest. When a martyr dies, and it's been consistent, you know, through Scripture, uh, through history, those places where people have been martyred for their faith, there has been a harvest unto the Lord. That's all we have to think about is uh, those who were killed by the Albanians. Rachel, uh, Nate Saint, and I can't even remember all their names, but uh, who gates of splendor is the name of the book. But you can look at it everywhere um, this has happened. And because it has happened, it's opened up doors for the gospel to go forth. So something good. Wheat in the field, the grain in the field, dying, producing a harvest. You know, if you can think of your, your death or your, the way that you die is producing a wondrous thing to people coming to Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? We don't want that. The scripture says that it's a, it's a very biblical thing. And we know it's true. It happens all the time. So then we have a third one. Well, let me finish that. It says, not that we wish it, but this is a privilege to suffer or die for the gospel's sake. Even suffering. We don't really suffer in this country like they suffer overseas, or they suffer in other countries for their faith. 
Your churches may be attacked. They might break into the church. They might kill the pastor and spread the people. They might be breaking into their houses. And you say, well, that's all they have to do is go along with the, the evil people. But these folks aren't doing it. God gives them grace. You know, when I was a young Christian, some of the books I read were tortured for his faith and tortured for Christ. And they're scary books. And yet, God used those books to show, show the reality of what Christianity is all about. And then we have the last one. It's called the intercessor. And let's turn to Ezekiel 22, 30. Ezekiel 22, 30. I don't mind getting there slowly. That just means you guys got to find your way also. I encourage you to bring the Bible to yourself to see that these things are so. Um, you know, I don't care if you use your uh, iPad or whatever. Bring the Bible. Bring the Word of God. You know, we're talking about these Bible sticks going out to the military. What a blessing to be able to hear the Word of God. Maybe they can't bring a Gideon Bible that's going out in the field. They can use by the sticks. But in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30 says, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me and be on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. And it goes on. In fact, it says that in the next text, it says, Therefore I have poured my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have not, and I have recompensed them their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord. And the Lord Himself stands in the gap for us. It says that in that text. But we all have holes in our wall. We all have areas that we have no defense. We have areas in our life that somebody needs to pray about. Somebody needs to be, you know, an intercessor for us to pray about these things, some weakness, some fault, some place where the enemy can get at us to destroy us. You know, we can think of, uh, of olden times when we think of a wall and we have the enemy coming against them and a hole in the wall, what's going to happen? Doesn't it allow the enemy to get at us? And hasn't the enemy gotten at us because we have holes in our defense system? And praise the Lord when we say, I've got this problem or I've got this struggle. Will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? Will you pray in such a way, Lord, that, uh, that let them pray in such a way that that hole in the wall is filled? If you can fill the field, you can say there's a hole in the wall, but if there's a man or a woman standing there in that hole, you have a wall again. I appreciate Jack. I believe Jack is, he's told me, he won't, he won't, he won't tell you that. He's too humble. But the Lord told him the most significant thing in his life is he's going to pray. That's pretty significant, isn't it? There are my, I've had a look at Jack's knees, all kind of brown. I've been kneeling all the time and praying. No credit to you, Jack. You know, that's the Lord. You see, let's get to the Holy Spirit. I believe there are those. Most of us all need, Jerry talked about it. We all need pray. We all need to ask the Holy Spirit to work in our church, to be released to a greater understanding and a greater use of prayer. I need that. I struggle with prayer. I want to pray better. I want to see God work. I don't, I don't see myself as an intercessor, but we can. And this is a gift of the Holy Spirit. You want to say, Lord, I would like to be a person who stands in the gap. Amen? I would be like the person for the church, for the people in the church. 
Our, don't we stand in the gap for our families, for our unsaved loved ones, and even for our saved ones? You see, and so we have to understand that. Intercessor to his, or intercede or pray on behalf of another, every church needs men and women who are devoted, have devoted themselves to pray for others. These folk understand the importance of prayer and spend a lot of time doing it. Moses was such a man. Psalm 106, 23. And we were talking about it, I think, at the uh, planner's retreat. And maybe this morning, I don't remember. Do you suppose that when uh, Moses came down from the mountain and he saw the people building a golden idol, that God was upset? And didn't Moses pray for the people that he, they would not he would not destroy those people. You know, it would be easy if he would just turn them all into a good spot and start all over. But, you know, but we see that. Moses was an intercessor. So was uh, Samuel. The scripture, there's scripture on that. I don't have it with me right now. But Psalm 106, 23. 106, 23 says this. Um, I got the part right here to read the whole thing. <clears throat> Therefore, he said, he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he destroy them. Moses stood in the breach. Um, Jesus prayed so much for his disciples, he desired that they, they wanted to, to, to learn from him. Teach us to pray to the Lord. Um, people who do this are normal folks, but they know the importance of God in prayer. You know, you know Elijah was praying, and God answers his prayer. He says he's a light passion. He's a man like us. I don't see him as a superman, but he's a man of light passion as we are. Yet when he prayed, God answers his prayers. He said, oh, Lord, I like to be like Elijah. I, yeah, I've got like passions like Elijah. I get mad. I get upset. I get depressed. I get discouraged. I don't know what to say. But I can pray. And even though I'm normal and I struggle with prayer, I'm going to continue to do it because I know many wonderful things will be done by the power of prayer. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you for the truth that's in the Word of God. And I know there all of us need to pray. And this doesn't take anything away from you, Lord, but I know that there are people you have, uh, you have given. I know that there have been revivals that have been started. Because the people, the normal people, sometimes handicapped people, have committed themselves to pray. And Lord, I just ask, even in our own church, you would raise up those who, who would intercede, that would stand in the gap for those in our church, um, for what's going on in our government, Lord, for the future. Lord, I just ask that you would raise up those kinds of people. And Lord, I do pray for those who are single and enjoy it. Praise the Lord for that. I do pray for those who really want to get married again, Lord, I just ask that you would work it out. We can't do that. You, you bring along that, that person for them. Hallelujah, Lord. And Lord, I don't think anyone wants to be a, considered a martyr. None of us really want to suffer. That's no fun. But Lord, you prepare us for whatever the future holds. And we do pray for our brothers and sisters around the world today who are suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ. And these are people who, there are brothers and sisters that are, are hurting and are struggling and are starving. Lord, we just ask that you would minister to them. And I know they're praying for us. They're praying for us that we would learn the suffering is all about. Lord, take care of our brothers and sisters going through this. And again, Lord, we thank